Welcome, y'all. We're gonna have, we're at the Student Games Festival Day Two production panel. Thank you all for coming. We got a stacked panel for everybody, but the real question is, who are they? So we're gonna find that out right now. First, we're gonna go from top to right, top right of my screen. I hope it's the same for you, Paul Beleza. Hi. Who are you? Hello, what have you done? Right. Why are you here? Oh, uh, I I was randomly spawned on the planet in the early 80s uh, and okay. decided to become a video game producer much later. Uh, I, okay. Yeah, hi. I'm, I work at Riot. I've been at Riot for 12 years in production roles, um, but came from a game program uh, at USC. So I'm very much familiar with the student game development process, and I'm happy to talk to all of you today. I work on Valorant, but I worked on League of Legends for 10 years before that. So there you go. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna go from right to left and around. Nathan, you're up. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nathan Moore. I'm a currently an associate producer at Blind Squirrel Games. Uh, I've worked on some good titles and some really bad ones. Uh, and before that, I uh, was I helped get um, the Cal State Long Beach's Game Development Club off the ground. Uh, was its president for a while, which really got me on the path pr to production. Uh, and then I got, you know, trapped there, learned to love it, a little bit of Stockholm Syndrome going on there, and then here I am. Okay, well, we'll talk about that later. I want to touch on that. Uh, Mary. Mary Hi, Sanzo. everyone. Why are you here? What have you done? Uh, my name is Mary Sanzoni. I work at Turtle Rock Studios, and I am a game producer. I went to Cal State Fullerton, um, actually had a completely different major than video games, but ended up in this crazy industry and stuck in with it ever since. Cool, cool, cool. Next, we have Robin Hunnicky. Why are you here? What have you done? Uh, my name is Robin Hunnicky. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Phenomena, which is a game company in San Francisco. We just released with Tom for the PlayStation. Um, I started off in video games as a fan of the idea of experimental gameplay and ended up uh, helping invent the concept of game jams. So I'm the first female game jammer on the planet Earth. And uh, it's been 20 years now watching game programs and game jams become not just a practice for developers, but for students as well. And so in addition to working on a bunch of cool games like The Sims and Journey and Watam, I've also uh, founded a game program at UC Santa Cruz, which is why I know so much about games and game curriculum. And so I spent the last 15 years of my life trying to promote the idea of building games inside of the college environment and giving people degrees to do it and then encouraging them not just to go work in the industry, but to make the industry a place that's welcoming for them. So I am particularly interested in issues for devs of color, uh, people who are queer, trans, and uh, differently abled getting into the game space and making games that represent their perspective. That's super awesome and super prepared. <laughs> it's as if I've been doing it for a very long time. I'm also oh, as if she's been doing it for a very long time. I'm old, <laughs> oldest person in this in this panel. So I represent all of the old people that, for the most part, are not as flexible as me. I'm glad that we could have that representation here. Claudia, Rose, O'Flaherty, why are you here? What have you done? It was real close if the last name. You gotta. Oh really? <laughs> it wasn't perfect. You don't have to say the H. You just sort of. It's okay. Flaherty. Oh, Flaherty. <laughs> Oh, Flaherty. You keep putting that accent on it. I've never heard that in my entire life. It's Irish. Oh, I'm Irish. You know what? This panel isn't about of us how to Irish. pronounce your name. Yeah, Go for it. Uh, hello. Oh. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, I am currently an associate producer at Cloud Imperium Games, where I work with the character team. Um, before that, I was a uh, pro from UCI's VGDC, which is, you know, it's a thing we all do. Um, I was originally not going to do games. I wanted to be a film producer. Then I made the horrible mistake of taking a computer games, like, writing module thingy majig <laughs> class. And my TA was like, you should go make video games. And I was like, that, yeah, this has been more fun than all the movie shit I was trying to do before. So it sounds good. And uh, I hopped over to video games and haven't really looked back. Yeah, this sounds like a panel of people who have made similar mistakes, so I'm looking forward to the rest of this. <laughs> oh, so, <what> a mistake. <laughs> let's jump right into it. So, people, and I, just to get you guys to know the format, if you guys want to, like, interrupt, you know, raise your hand, talk out of order, I don't mind, but 
I'm gonna like call on people just so that we uh just to start the question so that we avoid dead air. Huh? Oh no, Paul introduced. Paul introduced in the beginning. Sorry. My stream master, he is making sure I do my job. And I am. So he's my producer. And let's jump right into it. First question of the day. People usually don't start out wanting to be a producer. I think it's pretty obvious from a lot of the intros you guys gave. They fall into production while trying to do something else. How did each of you fall into production? Let's start with Mary Sanzoni. Yeah, a great question for me. Um, I actually started as admin at Turtle Rock Studios and I completely was new to the industry. And just like you mentioned, I saw what producers did because I had no idea that there were project managers, producers and video games. And I watched what they did and I got really excited. I thought I would be a good fit. So they kind of did like a, a trial run, if you will, to kind of test the ropes. And uh, that went well. And so I just hit the ground mm -hmm. ever since. Awesome. Nathan? Yeah, so um, I mean, I think part of the reason that few people like want to get to the production thing is because uh, you know, at least for me, a lot of what I do is I talk to people about how games are made. Like that's, you know, 50, 60% of what I do. Uh, and like, that seems like a really weird job description uh, that doesn't, it isn't really obvious. Um, so I didn't, I didn't even know that it existed. Um, and I originally wanted to be a environment artist. Um, and I did a lot of research into how to become that and trolled forums. And I think I must've run into a, a, a group of like really crotchety engineers who were really pissed off at artists continuously feeding them assets that were unusable. Um, okay. So I wanted to learn how to not do that, which yep. taught me computer science skills, which then meant that I was one of the few people on campus who knew how to like communicate between those two groups. Mm -hmm. And since no one else was going to do it, and I wanted to trick people into making games that I could do art assets for, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I ended up running that. And then people were like, oh, well, you're doing this. So I guess you're just stuck in it now. And eventually I came to like it. Awesome. Paul? OK, I'll unmute every time I'll talk because I breathe heavy. Um, I, so, so I actually came to games as a second career. I was a high school teacher and uh, early, early in my career and decided mm -hmm. I don't like this very much. It's fun but I don't like it as much as I'd like to. So I made, I made the jump into games. And uh, I started off in QA while we were searching ways to find a way in an industry. Because I had no, I'm not, a, I'm not an engineer. I'm not an artist. I didn't have any of those core skills. So as I did research at the time, I was like, well, perhaps I could become a game designer because I was studying games as much as I could as a player and reading you know, articles and just doing all the research. I figured I, I would want to try that. So was in QA, decided that, there is a path in QA into game development on the publishing mm -hmm. side, most like, more or less. And I realized mm -hmm. I wanted to be closer to the actual development side. And in order to do that, I would need to work at a development studio and build mm -hmm. skills in that regard. So I decided to apply to um, USC because I had just started their game master's program in the mid 2000s. And I thought, well, this would be my way to perhaps get an internship in design and make mm -hmm. my way into one of the major studios so I could build the skill sets to do the job full on. So within my first year in, in learning game design and doing the craft of game design, I realized I didn't have the patience for the iterative cycles required to be good at game design. I just, mm. my personality gets very frustrated with the amount of revisions needed to do it well. And I respect it, but just knowing myself, I was like, I am not going to enjoy this. But what I did enjoy was helping guide my peers and my friends organize their thoughts and their ideas in tangible ways and really talking through the experience of the game and going, well, how do we bring that to life? And I realized in those conversations that I became a producer and all my, my, my right in that moment. And my peers were like, well, can you help me organize my projects? And eventually I became our classes producer and then started learning the craft of the project management, the software management and the discipline communication mm -hmm. you do the job. So for me, it, 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 it culminated with attempting to be a designer, realizing I did not like it, and making a, a, a switch into something that used my skill set and my passion to help in other ways. I hear that story a lot. You also, when you were a biology teacher, did you get a 
reviews from students that if you want to take this class and hear from a guy who talks about video games instead of the actual material, you should take this class. You can look that up on uh, ratemyteacher.com and find those ratings <laughs> to this day. And I stand by them as testament to my passion many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, next, uh, Claudia. Um, hi. I kind of resent the whole fell into production mentality because it creates a lot of lazy producers. Um, no, no offense, but I'm sure you've all seen it. Um, I wanted to be a film producer before I got into games production. And while I had considered going into other avenues of games, specifically art, and I had a passion for that, um, by no means do I consider production to have been something I fell into by accident. Um, mm -hmm. I am a person who's been organizing schedules and budgets since I was... Well, actually, for a very long time, my mom stopped buying us groceries in high school and was like, here's some money. You guys figure that shit out. And it was very important because it was on her part, a life skill teaching thing. But yeah, I've been mm -hmm. that person for a very long time. And so production was in some ways a very intentional choice. And I lucked out a lot because I did have a passion for art as well. When I got the job at Cloud Imperium, part of the reason I wanted it so badly is because it was production for the character art team. So I got mm. to use both sets of skills and actually have something that was useful going in instead of like, I don't know, going in as a producer for engineering. Like I would I would have loved that. I hung out with engineers all through college. It wouldn't have been horrible. But because I had been passionate about art beforehand, going into a character art team, I just I had a lot more context for what they were doing, was able to be a lot more helpful. Awesome. Super interesting. Robin Hunnicky? Yeah, so I guess I, I don't know that I've ever become anything specifically. And so I am a producer mm. and I am a CEO and I am a designer. I'm also trained as a classical painter and a fine artist. My parents wanted me to be a painter. So the, the early part of my life, I spent a lot of time doing art classes and summer schools and camps and stuff around being creative and making two-dimensional and three-dimensional art. And then I ended up getting introduced to computers through a program that I went to for a summer over in Cambridge, England, where I was able to take photographs at the computer. Uh, it was really early on before any of you were even a blink in a parent's eye. And, and I found the idea of using computers to edit art really interesting. And then as I started to go into college and try to figure out like, what's my career going to be? Um, it was a it was a very uh, tumultuous time. There were a lot of wars happening. We had a very conservative government. I was not that interested actually in having a job, so I stayed in school for like ten years. I went to school. I graduated in three years, but then I just hung around. And then mm -hmm. I got into a graduate program, and I started doing AI and programming on robots and stuff. And I kept mm -hmm. hanging around. And then eventually I ended up doing a PhD on adjustment of video games because that was just what tickled my fancy. I'd been a game player for a long time, but mm -hmm. um, my career that I was going to be able to do from, from the work I was doing was going to be basically building autonomous drones, mobile robots oh. that kill people. And I didn't want to oh. do that. And so I decided that I would live a service oriented life where I'd try to be a zero. So not a, ne a negative force and not necessarily a positive force, but just kind of zero it all out. And uh, video games seemed like I could use my skill set that I developed and my curiosity about art to make something cool with people that were cool. And I felt that the main reason I ended up in the game community was because they were my people. Like when I met programmers and artists and designers in games, they were all polymaths. They were all interested in a lot of different things. They had a massive amount of curiosity. And they were a little bit punk rock. You know, they didn't really give a shit. They didn't try to look nice at work. They weren't corporate it felt like i could be myself you know kind of a little bit angry and a little bit queer and a little bit different from everything all the time and not stand out um even though there were not that many women involved in the field at the time and so i think i was drawn to the ethos of creative iteration and development i mean i can remember meeting paul and paul was a student uh and was working you know in the same space and and just knowing from just a few conversations with him even when he was still in school this kid is going to be a developer not not necessarily a producer but just that that he had the same kind of creativity he's going to be in it has. he's going to do it right like it, it, it yeah. it's a community that attracts a certain kind of creativity so i think i ended up in production to be totally honest because being a designer at my first job in electronic arts um, a lot of the power in the organization was consolidated in production. And if you were a designer, you got a certain budget and a certain timeline and a certain number of people, and then you were told kind of how to do things. 
But if you're a producer, you got to set those things up and then you could support the people around you with with actual power and make sure that good things got done on games. And so I think I did it because I didn't want to watch lazy producers, to, to, to put it bluntly, um, mm -hmm. kind of be in the driver's seat. Uh, and so I think that maybe the ultimate answer is that I'm a little bit of a of a control freak and I want things to change. And oh. so when things aren't going my way, I try to figure out how to get into that position and, and make it make a difference, you know? So it's it's probably a result of my OCD slash spectrum order um, problem, but maybe okay. that's a benefit in this case. Okay, very cool. Thank you all. We're gonna jump into something a bit more introductory for people that don't necessarily know what does a producer actually do? And although we could spend hours talking about that question, we're going to try to keep it to a succinct, like, 10-minute block that includes all of you. So we'll try. Um, for, this is from Chelsea Chung. A description I've heard of producers is to be the team's glue. How are you the glue? We'll start with uh, Claudia. That's unfair. I thought I was going last. Ha! Ah. Um, because uh, it's kind of like if a developer, if it's a job of a developer isn't doing, the producer is probably doing it. So um, in a, on an art team, for instance, there's a lot of database management that needs to get done. And while a lot of that does come down to the devs who need to, you know, know what things are, where they go and how they go there, um, Cloud Imperium has some messy database history because they started as a startup and basically when they started didn't build infrastructure such that it's easy to you know maintain separate out and keep track of the hundreds of assets that are necessary for an MMO so stuff like that um, mm. which is super important for handoffs between the different departments on an art team tends to get funneled through production or production coordinators um, external information from other teams also gets funneled through me instead of going directly to the artists at Oh, uh oh, we dropped her. No, oh, no. <laughs> Claudia, come back. Did I just so cut well. out? Did I just cut out? Yeah. You just cut out. Yeah. Oh my were, God, my computer went about... back. And okay. Um, okay, you were saying something about funneling off to the art team. Um, just stuff that comes in uh, goes through me. It doesn't go directly to people on the art team because mm -hmm. that's like the easiest way to get someone to go, oh, shiny and forget about the thing that they were actually supposed to be working on. Uh, and then mm -hmm. just having, yeah, uh, centralizing a lot of information is kind of the primary thing I do um, as a someone who's like attached to a specific team as opposed to handling some overarching project. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh by the way, just want to caveat for future discussions. Not everybody needs to answer every question. If you're like, that other person got it like really well, you don't have to. If you feel like you're like, no, I want to have my piece, totally too. Okay, moving on. We're going to go to Robin Honecky. What you got? How's the producer so, of the team's glue? So the producer, in my, in my opinion, creates the picture of what the game is currently. Um, everybody has an idea of what the game is going to be. There's design docs, there's hopes and dreams, there's late night highs, fantasies of what you're gonna build. There's all kinds of like innovations that happen when a game is getting made. People strike gold sometimes just while working on a system and then suddenly that gets in the game. And then other times you work for a really long time on something and it's really not gelling. And it's the producer's job to be a little bit ahead of the boat, like almost like standing up at the very front in the crow's nest, looking out at the terrain ahead and then looking back at the boat and saying, okay, this is what the boat currently has. Mm -hmm. And this is what the weather is ahead we're going to need to add some oars here or we're going to need to figure out how to bail this part out because there is a storm coming and we cannot take on any more water, right? Like it's the producer's job to build that picture for the team, which often means being more of a pessimist and more of an optimist at exactly the same time. So you have to understand every aspect that's going into the part of the game that you're responsible for. So in my job, I'm typically the executive producer, which means I need to have a team of people reporting to me and I create the picture amongst them through creative discussion about our challenges and, and our wins. And then I help them disseminate that information throughout the rest of the team or the organization, depending on how big or small the project is, so that we don't get lost. Because games can get lost pretty quickly and actually dramatically. And like a game can, 
you know, um, I've been playing Legends of Ruterra, for example, and that game went on for what, eight, nine years. You know, it was in, in production for a very, very long time and cost a lot of money to make. And I'm really fascinated by games like that because they have so much complexity in their designs. And I always wonder, like, what was it like being the producer on those projects and how to keep them on 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 track? So I think it's not about having a specific destination in mind, but about, um, yeah, creating the picture of where you are so that people can live with that and be OK with it and still keep going. Cool, cool, cool. Excellent answer. Paul, I see you nodding your head a lot like, yes, yes, ditto, ditto. Uh, I, I think the that, an, like, Robin's answer, and uh, I'm sorry, I forget the person before uh, Robin, what was, what was? Claudia. Claudia. Claudia and Claudia's answer, thank you. Uh, really aptly put it. Plus one I would add to that is it, it is our, our, our job as production to ensure the team is set up for success, and that means getting the most out of everything everyone's different skill and, um, superpowers. And as mm -hmm. producers, um, in addition to painting that vision of the future and unblocking the team to do it, and mapping those things opportunistically so you get a win-win for both the person's development and for the project. Mary with making the project even better. And us as producers uh, have a special job to ensure that happens in order to get the best out of people and the Awesome answers. Thanks. Mary, Nathan, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I think those were fantastic uh, answers. Um, if, so if someone wants to look into what producers do in the game industry, like Robin's answer of like kind of steering the ship and like making sure your, your team is okay below and they're getting what they need, but also having seeing what's coming down and making sure that you're not going in the wrong direction or headed into a storm. You go from like the day to day to like, hey, do you need something? Do you need to talk to a different department? Mm -hmm long-term planning of, okay, we need to make sure we work on these features next month because we have to meet the project needs. So those guys absolutely nailed those answers. All right. All right. Great. Great. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, my bit to add uh, is just maybe like the kind of foofy high-level version of it. Um, like uh, in, my, in my mind, the way that we're the glue for the team is that we sort of um, – like build and maintain the connections between people. Like, um, I think it'd be hard for a producer to be super useful if you have a team of like one developer and one producer. Like, I don't know that that would be the best ad for your team for your team of one. Yeah, yeah, um, probably not. Um, and so, you know, when you have a concept artist who's trying to deliver a piece of concept art to a three D modeler. Like that's a connection that has to exist and that's a connection that has to be efficient. Um, and then when that 3D modeler pa passes that off to your tech artist to uh, rig, that's another connection and that has to be efficient and that has to work well. And then when that's getting you know put in game, that's a connection to an engineer. And so it's really in those kind of connection spaces that I feel that um, that's like a big, that's like the big territory for producers. And, and that's really how we provide how we're the glue and those those connections aren't just like pipeline connections those aren't just like oh how well is this asset like it's also you know how well is how well like the social connections as well mm -hmm. uh those get overlooked really easily um but you will lose a ton of usefulness um that's hard to quantify but you'll lose a ton of usefulness if those kind of social connections aren't strong as well so mm -hmm. i Personally, I see that as, an, as another aspect of, of, of production. And I'm talking about that part because, you know, everything like the looking ahead, like the scouting ahead, making sure the team understands what the goals are and is charting towards those goals. Everyone said the, those things perfectly. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a bit of social engineering, I was going to say. There's a lot of there's a lot of little little snags that can happen on a team that if you're not paying attention to the relationships can get in the way of collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important part of the job, Nathan. That's super interesting, something I, uh, I do want get, to get into also. When we're talking about production, oftentimes, like our management role, we usually think of them, say, the taskmaster. They're making sure that the thing's going to ship. We're going to get a product out. People are going to get paid. But there's also the other side of just making sure that, well, a pro it's been said that a producer doesn't just ship a product. They ship a team. 
and making sure that that team is a well-oiled machine that likes working together is its own challenge in itself. What challenges have you run into where someone just does not like working with person A and that has crippled your production and how did you uh, solve that or try to? Uh, we'll start with Nathan. Or, oh, Mary, did you have something to start on that? Oh, totally fine. I, I, ha I thought you had said my name, but I must have heard it wrong. Oh. Uh, no, no worries. Uh, we'll start with Nathan, then we'll go to Mary next. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that there are, um, like, personality conflicts. Like, I think once you get to personality conflict, like, we usually see them as personality conflicts. I think yes. um, uh, once it gets to, like, that's a symptom of essentially miscommunication and misunderstanding most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, the way that I have seen that, I don't know that I've necessarily seen that cripple teams because like, you know, theoretically you should be able to work with someone that you don't like. Um, yeah. uh, but the way that I've seen it certainly reduce efficiency is, and th those are in like the connections that are kind of hard to quantify is like, you know, that person might be less likely to get up and talk to this person that they don't like uh, mm -hmm. to get help. Or maybe it takes them two more hours to like, you know, oh, I give up, I guess I have no choice but to talk to this person. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they've spent another two hours beating their head against this problem. So they're gonna be going into this conversation with someone that they already have some friction with more frustrated. Um, so those are the, the, those are the issues that that causes. Um, and uh, like, you know, I, I've, I've only been at this for a few years now, so I'm still learning how to uh, solve that problem. Um, but, you know, since it's, since it's source from what I've observed is uh, misunderstanding, um, like working to get these people to understand each other's goals, uh, understand like why, cause you know, like these misunderstanding comes from trying to solve work problems. So ultimately mm -hmm. both of these, like these two people, these two made up people in question are, are the frustrations come from different ideas about how to solve problems that ultimately the team is trying to solve together. Mm -hmm. um, so like helping people understand how to, like why their process is the way it is and trying to figure out a way to work with them to make like kind of uh, smooth the friction of those, these two kind of conflicting ideas of problem solving is um, how I've attempted to handle it with some successes and some not so much. Of course. Mary? Uh, so very similar to that answer. Many times if there's friction, I found that people have different ways of communicating, as we all do. So to get like a very specific example, um, let's say person A likes to have like, like they're in the zone and they have their headphones on and they want to jam something out. And person B likes to have verbal conversations and is constantly like, hey, can I talk to you about this? Hey, can I talk to you about this? That's that's two different communication styles. So sometimes as a producer, you kind of have to learn how those two people work and go, hey, if you, the person that likes to talk in, in, like in person and have a chat, if you send them an email ahead of time or a message and say, I want to talk to you about this, here are my thoughts, you let me know when you have time to, to chat it out. And that way, person A can turn around and go, okay, I'm focused, I have the headspace, I'm not just like, getting poked when maybe it's not a great time for them. So I usually try to figure out, okay, are they just communicating in different ways? And is there a mutual ground that we can bring them to um, if, if there's some sort of friction? Okay, I heard a lot about like limiting the friction between people just from the outset, from the outset recommending people do this so that this thing just won't happen. And then you'll have All a better right. time. I was going to say that I've actually uh, had some some issues with people who don't get along where uh, the resentment has been building silently between uh, two disciplines. So, for example, an engineer mm -hmm. and an artist. Um, the artist feels that the engineer isn't doing enough to support the style that they want to build. The engineer feels that the artist is entitled and expects 
certain core gameplay features to be put on hold so that they can get this really great anti-aliasing or some kind of lighting model implemented. And they feel pressured to sideline things that are going to benefit, say, a different set of people on the team by this mm -hmm. one personality that seems like a prima donna. I've definitely had that kind of situation occur where the disciplinary discussion about the artist versus the engineer become this low level fuel for a personality conflict that is really based on a lot of misconceptions as Nathan was saying. And so in those in those contexts, what I have done is I've actually mandated that they go out together on on a, on a lunch date. I've, I've said, okay, really? you're, you're gonna have to go out to lunch together for four weeks in a row every Thursday. And then every Friday, I'm gonna have a meeting with the two of you and we're gonna talk about what you talked about over lunch. And we're going to get to know wow. each other a little bit, and we're going to build a little bit more. You don't have to talk about work if you don't want to, but you have to spend time together, and then you have to report back to me how that's going. And after the first couple of lunches, it gets better. The first two are very awkward. They don't like each other. They have a lot of preconceived notions. As you break down the barrier between those two people and get them to know each other as people, it really helps. You have to do that in organizations where that's not a philosophy in general. Like at my company, I never have this problem anymore, but I definitely had it at EA where you have a very large group of people that get hired in very quickly. And there's not yet on a small team, those kinds mm. of things generally don't fester, but on a large team, especially that, 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 that staffs up quickly. Um, you sometimes have to be very heavy handed and say, you're going to spend time together. You're going to work together. You're going to be professional. You're going to create a relationship. And, uh, and then we're gonna talk about that relationship as a team. So I think you can be very direct about what the problem is if you, if you can spot it early enough. Cool, that's so, that's so funny, but that it also makes total sense. Claudia? I love that trick, I'm stealing that. <laughs> um, so- it's yours. Uh, it's amazing, because uh, I've had a couple people on the team who are, mm, it's a decently sized group, the one I'm working with now. The primary actual conflict, though, I ran into was that uh, they hated producers. Um, oh. Like my very first, it, which is ba bad for production, by the way, and efficiency. Uh, my very first mm -hmm. week, I think, I sat down at a table with like two of the directors and like we were having a really brief conversation. And he's like, you know, company I came from before didn't even have producers. We didn't even really need them. And he, and he was like, you know, what do producers do anyway? And then, like, there was a beat. And then he goes, so what company did you come from? And I was like, college? Um, <laughs> so <laughs> my, uh, my team had a series of producers that had done various things, but they mainly walked away feeling like they didn't like producers. And there was one lead who didn't talk to me for, like, three months. It was fine. Like, we sorted it out. But um, okay, good. the way you, you sort it out. Was that no, no actually. Um, what happened was uh, their relationship with production was such so bad that I was actually hired specifically with that in mind. Um, the director of the oh. team basically was like, I need you to come in and I need your primary focus to not be the internal stuff for now. I'll handle that. I want you to be the person who stands like outside the team and like bounces shit away for a while. Um, so basically um, my first couple months in there was me kind of, I, I got to know the team. I, I actually, we didn't get lunch, but I would basically every day like pick an artist and like sit over their shoulder and talk to them and, Hey, what are you doing? And why are you doing it that way? And how does this work? And so on and so forth. So I got to know a lot of their personal projects and stuff through that, which was actually very helpful long-term. Um, but then, you know, a couple months of them seeing someone do the job, they started to relax into having a producer around again. And then there was like, I remember the minute he started talking to me because it was the first time as a lead he had ever come up to me and said, hey, I need you to do something. I was so happy. It was like a little ask. It was like he needed me to like find an asset name or something. And I was like, <laughs> Did it. Um, but that, that was probably that little window of trust that you built, right? You build that little window of trust by sitting with the people and then just expands over time. Mm -hmm. And every time you have a positive interaction, you're just putting coins into that trust bank that you can spend later when you need to go to someone and say, I know it doesn't seem like a priority, but someone else is blocked. I really need you to pick this up today. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that that was beautiful. Tear to my eye. <laughs> uh, I want to ask Paul if he has anything to add to this, but it looks like he is loading on the stream. Paul, are you there? Mm -hmm. Are you speaking? If you are speaking, I can't hear you. We're... Looks like he's he's speaking in chat. What? He says. Wait. He's trying. He's trying. No, I I believe he's trying. 
I can see it here, all of yeah. you. You're just a couple of squares for us, dear. Yeah. Try try leaving the call and joining the call. Okay. Okay. And speak. How's that? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. We can see Yay! you. Hey, okay. pop I think back. I, I, I switched from Wi-Fi to LAN in the middle of it, so that must have wigged out everything. Um, OK, got it. Everyone's answers were excellent. I think, um, and no bullshit, for real. Like, at the end of the day, we're human beings, and we're just trying to find the best ways to work for each other. In some cases, as some people have said, it could be a misunderstanding of how disciplines work together. And so a sit down to really understand what do you need from each other as disciplines in order to, to achieve the goal can be helpful. And other times it can be a deeper personality thing, in which case that is more about human beings and, and their ways of communicating and, and potentially ways they've been burnt in the past and trying to figure out how do you work through that. In some cases, the, the, the humans are burnt out in which case you have to understand the root cause of that. I was brought onto a team once several years ago that was very, very underappreciated and very burnt out, but uh, fulfilling a core function for the game. It was a store team on League of Legends. And it's a mm -hmm. team that was very, in, no one sings praises of the store engineers. Everyone yeah. expects the store to work. So after years yeah. of being thankless. underfunded, yeah, it's thankless and neglected, I, I realized this team doesn't feel appreciated by anyone. So step one was establishing their brand to the rest of the organization to be like, this team fulfills a critical function for this game and this company. And if they weren't here, we wouldn't exist. So respect due to where respect is due. Number two, I had to understand the motivations of some of the leaders in the team and why they were so upset. And in some cases they were so burnt uh, we had to work through whether or not they still had the motivation to work on the team and through conversations wow. and behavioral things I noticed, such as just the way they spoke about decision making, whatever, I had to pull a few aside and go, here's the direction we're going. Here's what the company needs from us. Here's what the, the game needs from us. Are you, does that still excite you? Be truthful. And they had to go, no. And I'm like, let's find you another team. Because ultimately the people who are excited will be impacted by you as a leader and you set the tone. So if you're not setting the right tone, everyone will follow suit and that's bad for everything. So let's find you the right team. In one case, I had to just kick someone off the team straight up because they, they couldn't see it for themselves. And I had to document, you know, here's your behaviors and the impact of behaviors on these other mm -hmm. disciplines. This is why it's unacceptable. So that means as a pr as production group, part of our job is setting expectations of behavior. That could be through team chartering, a, a team working code, but then holding everyone accountable to, to acting in accordance with that. Otherwise, it can be very bad. So a part of our job is to act as coaches and leaders in some cases and, and, I, and shining a light on, on just on the interactions as such. Phenomenal answers all around. Yeah. Inspiring. Um, I'm going to go more on the practical side since we've gotten so much high level knowledge at this point. Um, there's a lot of different production methodologies floating around. There's Scrum, there's Kanban, there's Lean, there's Waterfall. There's so many. Uh, uh, do you use a production methodology, like a specific one, or uh, a mix? Often people use their own blend. But when have you used a methodology and realized it didn't quite work for your project or your team? Uh, how did you address that and to make the team move forward more efficiently? And we will start with Paul. I think it depends on the project and, and the need. Different, all, mm -hmm. all production Definitely. methodologies are tools to solve problems. Definitely. And I would say some are stronger than others for the craft. So on more mm -hmm. content character, like a character team, for example, I worked on several. Yes. And there are there are definitely things that need to happen in a certain order for different disciplines to succeed. And thus, just based off logic, there's handoffs and scheduling and needs that each discipline has from each other. And I think in those cases, you can apply certain um, certain aspects of waterfall very usefully, and mm -hmm. especially like all the way down to QA and sound, who traditionally are people who feel a lot of pain because they're at the very end of the cycle. So there are ways you can yep. you can design a system around that. Uh, but then there's also uh, the, the mindset of iteration necessary for working on um, creative projects. So applying in, in creative content, like 
characters, art, art, um, map design, whatever, there needs to be an, an element of R&D. And I think some of the mindset mm-hmm. of Agile works very well in those early phases to define what are we making, why are we making it, and what's the right direction in accordance with the vision of the game. So I think mm-hmm. I've seen both used successfully in those regards. Whereas on engineering teams that are much more, it dep- again, depends on the the thing you're solving for. If you're trying to stand up a, a set a server architecture, there's probably a very clear pathway to do that, and certain you know code paradigms you're adopting from other other companies or just you know freeware or just whatever whatever methodologies to achieve a certain thing. You can take that off the shelf and apply. And then there's more. Uh, I'd say pure iteration where you're going here, what's the experience you're trying to create and, and week to week you're defining it with your engineering group, your product designers to get there. So it really depends on what the project needs at mm-hmm. the time. And it's up to us as, as production folk to kind of identify what, what unlocks the potential of the team and what system can you put in place ultimately to get the results versus one is better than another. It depends. I really love the description of the methodology as a tool. It's almost like when, there's like the the phrase when uh, it's like the one where a hammer and like you use the hammer for everything. Yeah. You like you don't use a hammer for everything. You use a hammer for no. a specific purpose. Yeah. Some production methodologies are hammers. Some production right. methodologies are yes. other things. Um, yeah. I'm assuming that. Yeah, if go for it, Robin. It, if you think about it as like mountain climbing, right? Like, mm-hmm. okay, you're going to try to get over the summit. Um, it really depends on the mountain. It depends on the weather conditions and it depends on the people that are on the climb. If they're inexperienced, you need different tools than if they're experienced. But there are certain safety precautions that you have to have with you no matter what in case the weather gets bad, right? And so like the the thing about production that I think is so important that Paul is trying to point out is that it's about learning the tool set. So what I tell my students, and I think it's really critical, is that everybody starts out with an empty toolbox. It doesn't matter whether you're a producer or a designer or anybody, your toolbox is totally empty. And then what you cram into that toolbox is failures. All of the failures that you have in your production career, whatever it is, go into that toolbox and they compress down together, they crenellate, and then they become stories. And you share those stories with other people. And as you collect and trade stories, they get more and more valuable because you start to realize that there are some, there are some canonical stories in your discipline. And then as you keep working in a discipline and getting more experiences and more failures and more stories, those compress down and they become wisdom. And those tools, the wisdom tools that you get, they're like little tiny, shiny stars at the bottom of your toolbox. Those come from years of exposing yourself to lots of different kinds of failure. And um, Mm -hmm. why it's so important as a producer to be agile in your process and thinking about what, like what Paul is saying is best for the team. Because if you make a mistake quickly, you can learn from it and then you can help everyone else create that wisdom. Um, and I think it's really why um, it's good to get experience working on lots of different kinds of games. And if you can, at different types of teams and different types of companies or inside your org, because you'll really learn that a team shape and then the mountain that you're climbing is 99% of what you have to pay attention to. And the process, actually, you can't get too precious about it. If you have a, a, a thing that you love to do, like you want everything to be on a post-it note and it has to be physical and then you whine about it if it doesn't work, then your team is just going to hate you. And that yep. I think that's actually why a lot of people don't don't like certain kinds of producers because they're more precious about the process and the people. Mm-hmm. It's like they, they believe this process is our one way yeah. ticket to getting this thing done. And if we don't follow it to the letter, then it won't work well. Yeah. Um, that's the dark side. You can't believe that. Shit. If that's <laughs> true, all of us would be using the same methodology all together on every game, on every, any creative software ever on the planet. So it's fundamentally false. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Totally. passionate about this we'll go do you have anything does anybody else if you guys don't have anything to add i can move on to the next question uh oh uh oh am i am i yeah, okay no, cool there. all right you're cool Wait. all right uh start with lots of us to make sure people know i want to talk uh, um all right so yeah personally i i ran into um like i ran into the the pitfall of this and i'm sure a lot of like the aspired producers out there are are wondering, well, you know, my toolbox has like a screwdriver in it. My my toolbox is very empty because I don't have much experience. So how do I know which process to use? Um, uh, so talking to your team and, and and trying to build up the trust so you can have really constructive and honest conversations with your team about what's working for them and what's not is really helpful. 
Um, because what I did is, so Blind Squirrel Games is a uh, work for hire studio. So we mostly do ports and remasters. And from that perspective, um, we're probably one of the more like waterfall-esque production methodologies for those games, because those games have already been figured out from start to finish. It's just like, like there's not a whole lot of uh, like design iteration that happens. There's art iteration, there's engineering iteration, but without that design iteration, there's it's a lot more stable mm -hmm. um, um, in theory. Um, and so that was what my first experience was. And then when I uh, was moved on to production uh, for our own internal IP that we were starting up, I tried to kind of apply those same tools uh, to that process. And it's, it does end up being, being very different. Um, mm. And I would say that uh, it wasn't until, um, you know, I really started talking with the team that I started being able to kind of like correct those things. And also, you know, ideally a like, you know, ideally you have someone who can, you know, help point out your pitfalls. Like, you know, well, going back to one of the earlier questions, um, where, you know, Robin was talking about like, you know, that, or that EP that's at the, at the front of the ship, who's kind of like, you know, steering you away from the icebergs. Um, that's hard as an associate, that's hard as like a one year or like, I've been at this for six months producer. Um, and so hopefully you have someone who can help you with that. Um, but if you don't have that person, then talking to the team is really important. Uh, and, uh, they're going to be your best, uh, they're like the team is your most important customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so they'll, they'll help you, uh, figure out what you need to do to improve your process. Sounds like listening, 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 listening as a, as a producer. Um, it sounds like uh, a, lot a lot of notes. You have to write down a lot of shit because yeah. people say so much stuff. And at the end of the day, you'll think you have heard it and you have to go back and look at your notes and go, oh, I forgot about that. Oh, yeah, that was a doozy. That's definitely going to be one on one. 100 percent. When when I worked on teams and there's as a producer, I've I've been in a more of a management role. I'm just so like I need to have notes. I need to have documentation. If it if it's not documented, it doesn't exist. That's that's usually how, how it goes. And it's true. Like if it's not written down, people will forget. Also, people oh. think because they told you something that it's true. So they'll say, I did this thing, yes. and so and so is going to do yes. this. And if you don't write that down and then go confirm that so and so is actually going to do it, it probably isn't going to happen. And because they told you that it was going to happen, they think that you are responsible now for making sure that it's happening. And if you didn't write it down and go check, then you're screwed because the next meeting stand up happens and you're like, so so and so, you were going to do this. And they just go, what? They're like, what? And nobody told me to do that. And then the other person looks at you and is like, I told her you were going to do it because she said she wanted to know what was happening. So I assumed that she would make sure you did it. And it's, it's really your job to check in. So uh, vocalizing is not the same as getting something done. Yep. Totally, totally agree. Let's uh, transition. We got only a few minutes left in this panel. It's been great so far. You guys have gotten great answers. Uh, let's talk to the the aspiring producers, the ones who want to join the fray uh, in the companies. Producers uh, who want to get a job. Producers can't show their work with an artist portfolio or a GitHub with all their code. They have to show it some other way. For students looking for junior positions, how do they show that on a resume cover letter? What really stands out to you? We're going to start with Paul. I was about to type it in a bit just so I can get my notes together in my head. But I think ultimately oh. when, I, when I've counseled uh, humans on this, um, what results have you driven directly by the actions of your organizations? Uh, a lot of people go assisted, supported. And I, I usually tell them, what does that mean? Does that mean you help them organize a process and that out the result, the outcome of that process was increased productivity by Y percent or like really translating the accomplishments you have into this is how I directly made something better. And that to me has sh shown um, a results oriented sheet that is easier to talk about in point two. Um, mm -hmm. And I was there, you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Nathan. Uh, I mean, I think uh, 
plug for SGDA, uh, coming to events like this and running events like this um, are really important. Um, I think one of the big things, because uh, I've gotten the opportunity to start helping with uh, Blind Squirrel's um, hiring process for producers, um, which is awesome. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we really consistently look for above everything else is that desire to support your team. Um, mm -hmm. And I think like there has to be um, there has to be a drive to like really want game developers to um, I think like the you know we often say things like you know meet their full potential and stuff like that um, and uh, but you know I think there's also this idea that you know if a producer can, can if a producer can convey to me that they also want their team to like have the best game development experience possible. Uh, like we're all, we almost end up being like designers for the game development experience. Um, and uh, like if they can, if they can communicate that drive um, for that, uh, mm -hmm. I basically trust that they can pick up everything else. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting you mentioned that because like as a designer in a game, you're setting up the challenges, you're setting up what the player needs to do from next challenge to next challenge to next challenge and the producer in many ways does the same thing on the on the team they define a lot of the processes and what those challenges are that's a really interesting point mary you... yeah so uh, when hiring um producer roles with baby people that don't have enough experience um we know that we can't ask you like what have you done right what what tools do you have in your in your toolbox so um be prepared if they ask you like critical thinking questions like we mm -hmm. give you a Scenario, and it might not have anything to do with video games or people. It, it could be like windows on a house. We're just trying to look for how you break down a, a situation and how you get to that result. We just want to see like how you think and like talk us through your process. So just mm -hmm. be prepared that if you get on interviews and they ask you some crazy question about how many windows are in this building. It's just to kind of hear you think and see the end result that you get to. Okay, awesome. And Claudia? You're muted. You're muted. Well, I just got hired a year ago, so I haven't exactly interviewed a bunch of people or looked at a bunch of cover letters. Okay. Um, what but... was successful about yours? Because you got hired, obviously. Um, the biggest thing for my entire process because I was coming in with no experience but things like SGDA and game development clubs and running projects in college it does help if you mention it and you yeah um I uh I actually had probably the most fun I've ever had in an interview in my entire life when I interviewed for this position uh part of it was because I was so like hyped about character art um and so for me uh what that interview turned into about halfway through is um the director brought in the three leads the one who didn't talk to me for three months as well as you know two others um and it was the concept lead the character modeling lead and the tech lead and he was and he sat in the back of the room and he just watched me for the entire interview which was the weirdest power move i've ever seen but it was really funny um so they asked their questions and then when we were done they kind of gave me like the rest of the hour to sort of dig into stuff and i knew that i was being hired the director had already briefed me that i was being hired for like specifically these people specifically this team so we started you know i started asking the producer questions like hey you guys have a really big game i assume there's some kind of automation involved in that how does that tie into your processes right now who manages that how are you storing this data all of that stuff um and like uh, the way I thought about it later, because I did have so much fun in that interview, and if I ever get into another interview, I want it to go like that, is I mm -hmm. I was able to, because he gave me the three leads with the t of the team, I was able to sit down and actually figure out what their current problems are today and start talking with them about how they were trying to solve them, what they could do to solve them in the future, and so on and so forth. I mean, some of the stuff we talked about is stuff that's actually still relevant to my job today. In that interview, they told me about a tool that their team had been waiting on for a year. And um, part of like my job right now is pushing on the tools team, right, to get that thing done. And the only reason 
I knew about it is because I thought to ask about it in my interview, right? The, the producer I took over for didn't even know this tool existed because it was on a completely different team uh, in one of our other studios. Uh, but that's the kind of stuff that, I mean, I think is good in any interview if you do stuff like that. But um, that was- Ask questions, take notes. Yeah, do your job starting in the interview. <laughs> that's great. Do your job starting in the interview. I love that. Robin, we need- I. I trust you. You can be short, succinct, and get the, the point across. Go. <laughs> I look for exactly this kind of curiosity. Phenomena is 60% non-cis white male. So we have a lot of women, a lot of people of color, trans folks, queer folks. And I look for people that come in, bring their full selves to the interview, and present the values that they're going to make the team succeed. And what she described is exactly what we look for when we hire. I've hired a lot of people in my time, and I've fired a lot of people in my time. The people that stick around are the ones who care and who ask good questions and listen. Awesome. Awesome. So good. Okay. If you guys each have like 10 seconds down the line, what would you say to inspire the next generation? Of producers. Okay, we're gonna go with Paul, Nathan, Mary, Claudia, Robin. Claudia, take your hand off your face. We're doing this. Paul. It's okay. To, it's okay to not know. Be humble. Ask questions. A any question is valuable. Mm -hmm. Just go in with an open heart and mind and the willingness to learn. And nine times out of ten, people will answer and teach you. Awesome, Nathan. Uh, if you guys are here, you're already so close. Um, you guys are uh, a little bit of ways, a, a little ways away from like getting through the dark tunnel that is uh, college and stuff like that. You're almost there. You got this. Nice. Mary. Uh, if you guys like at the end of the day, all you want to do is help people go into production. It is worth it. Hang in there. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Just go for it. Phenomenal. Claudia. Uh, um, as a producer, you get the privilege of being the dumbest person in the room a lot of the times. So take advantage of that <laughs> for the rest of your life. You can always ask for questions. No one will ever think you're stupid, and it helps everyone else out because they actually don't know what they're talking about. Robin. <laughs> Nothing is fixed in stone. Nothing needs to be the way that it is. There's absolutely no reason that anyone that has power has it, and you can change any fucking thing you want to. Do it your way. Oh. Do it with pride, and it will actually get better. It always gets better, and it just keeps getting better. It's a fucked up time right now, but that just means it's a great opportunity for you to make shit better. That's awesome. This production panel is out. We got a thing coming up right now in one minute, so I gotta go. You guys did all amazing. See y'all. Bye.